Good morning, guys. <clears throat> Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? So this morning we're going to be reading out of Leviticus 6.13. But I wanted to throw a quick uh, quip in here. I was scanning through news articles. I may do a video later on some stuff going on in the Middle East. Um, and how there's some certain statements that are going on that are very telling about what's happening right now. Um, indicating to us the future. Uh, the very, very near future. So we may get into that later. It depends on how the day goes. So Leviticus 6.13, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar and it shall never go out. Let's go there. That's the verse. Now let's go up here because there's a context to this, even if the the devotion may speak on something different. One, two, three, four, five, right at the beginning, right here. The priests and the offerings. So in verse eight, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth upon the altar all night until morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. He shall put on his body and take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. This is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it on the altar before the Lord. He shall take it, and I have a context here, and a point that I'm going to make. He shall take from it his handful of the fine flour of the grain offering with its oil, and all the frankincense which is uh, on the grain offering, and shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma as a memorial to the Lord. And the remainder of it Aaron and his sons shall eat with unleavened bread. It shall be eaten in a holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of meeting they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy, like the sin offering and the trespass offering. All the males among the children of Aaron may eat it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings made by fire to the Lord. Everyone who touches them must be holy. So the point is here, how can you possibly get this right? I'm reading this and I'm picturing in my mind the intricacies of doing this and getting this put together and prepared and the amount of effort involved in trying to get this ready to present this is impossible. It's just impossible. I mean, it, I know how I am and if this was a situation, I'd be standing in one spot going, okay, but where is there a clean place away from the camp? Because we'd have to go and make a clean place. What kind of wood should we be using for the fire? Is there a specific type of wood? What if I get my linen garment dirty because I'm picking up ashes? They're going to blow around. You know, the sheer impossibility of doing this correctly staggers me. And I think that's the point. Now, the Lord wanted this done a specific way, but I think that's the point. You can't do it perfectly. I think that was the point that was me he was trying to get across to them. This is so intricate and specific. I mean, I would have to have the instructions with me, reading along, okay, I got to do this now, okay, I got to do this now. There's no way that I could, I could memorize this and remember to do all this so specifically. And I get the impression that's what, that, that was the point. I would always be wondering, did I do it right? <clears throat> I would always be worried. 
Did I do that the right way? Is the Lord going to be okay with that? And I kind of get the impression that that's what the point was. He was trying to show them that they couldn't. But there's another meaning behind it, and the devotion is going to reveal that to us. Keep the altar of private prayer burning. This is the very life of all piety. The sanctuary and family altars borrow their fires here. Therefore, let this burn well. Secret devotion is the very essence, evidence, and barometer of vital and experimental religion. Burn here the fat of your sacrifices. You know, there's a physical and a spiritual sacrifice. Let your closet seasons be, if possible, regular, frequent, and undisturbed. Effectual prayer availeth much. There's times where somebody's having a, there's a conversation going on in the vehicle I'm driving, and I'm in prayer. A lot of times. Effectual prayer availeth much. Have you nothing to pray for? Let us suggest the church, the ministry, your own soul, your children, your relations, your neighbors, your country, and the cause of God and truth throughout the world. Let us examine ourselves on this important matter. Do we engage with lukewarmness and private devotion? Is the fire of devotion burning dimly in our hearts? Do the chariot wheels drag heavily? <clears throat> if so, let us be alarmed at the sign of decay. Let us go with weeping and ask for the spirit of grace and of supplication. Let us set apart special seasons for extraordinary prayer. For if this fire should be smothered beneath the ashes of a worldly conformity, it will dim the fire on the family altar and lessen our influence both in the church and in the world. Well, how right he was. Whoever wrote this may not have realized how right he was. The text will also apply to the altar of the heart. This is a golden altar indeed. God loves to see the hearts of his people glowing towards himself. Let us give to God our hearts, all blazing with love, and seek his grace, that the fire may never be quenched, for it will not burn if the Lord does not keep it burning. Now let me throw in a side note here, because I get conviction from this, because I don't pray, and I know I don't pray, as often as I should, or even as detailed as I should. I've spent many years praying for many people. I spent many years beseeching the Lord, and I've gotten to the point where I've, I've seen zero result from a lot of this concerning specific individuals. Some, a little bit. And I'm almost at the point where I feel like I, I'm kind of wasting my time engaging in that anymore. Lord, you know what my heart desires concerning these individuals. I'm going to dedicate prayer to something else. And then I've gotten to the point where I don't know what to pray for anymore. I know I should pray for my country and pray for the people of my country, and I do. I know I should be praying for my family, and I do. But I'm at the point where I'm just like, is it going to make any difference anymore at this point? And I know that's a wrong idea to have, and I have to change that. It's worth stopping to pray for someone that needs it. It's worth taking a moment to send a prayer out to somebody in a comment section that's asking for prayer. It's worth responding to an email with prayer, responding to messages with prayer. It's worth it. I've pray, prayed with people I've talked to on the phone. I've lifted other ministries up in prayer. It's worth it to do that. And he answers prayer. He's answered tons of prayer on this channel. Uh, we were doing prayer requests uh, there for a while, and it and, and I'll, pray for, I'll pray for anybody. And he was answering tons of prayer. It was amazing some of the stuff he was doing. Sometimes it was literally while or before we even prayed. The, the situation was dealt with. I just had one answered recently with a sister. So yeah. We should be praying more. But what is the core or the structure of our prayer? Well, the prayer equals sacrifice. Morning and evening sacrifice in the book of Levit Leviticus consisted of two things, <coughs> blood and prayer. And so they would have the blood there, and then the focus was the prayer. The blood was to open the door. The focus was the prayer, morning and evening. And we had, I do these morning and evening devotions. I don't always pray in the evening devotion, but sometimes we do. 
But that was the focus. See, now we have the blood of Jesus as our sacrifice. There's no need to go find a blood, any blood to open the door. The door's open. Now it's prayer, morning and evening prayer. Because the focus in Leviticus was the prayer. Prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of praise, prayers of worship, prayers of glorification. A lot of it's thanksgiving. That's a whole lot of it. And that's what we do here when we pray. So by doing what we're doing here on this channel, we're actually fulfilling that part of the law. It's a spiritual aspect of it. So should we ever stop praying? No, we should always continue to pray. But we need to be realistic and remember what we pray for and who we pray for. Because there are some people that praying probably isn't going to do them any good. We can still pray for them. We have to be honest with ourselves. But there's always hope. Because God can do amazing things. I'm convicted in this in, my, in myself because I know I don't talk to him as much as I used to. And I don't talk to him as much as I should be. But my heart is always on him. My mind, my thoughts are always on him. What does he think? What's going on? What is he doing here? And I'm, I look for him acting in the world. So even though I may not talk to him as much as I do with my voice, I am always watching for him and looking for him and seeing him working. And I'm impressed by his work. I love it. I love watching him work. This world will do everything it can. There's a lot of aircraft flying around us today. There was another one now. There's been a lot of aircraft flying over the house today. Different kinds of aircraft. The world is going to do everything it can to try to get us distracted from that. But you know, a prayer doesn't have to be a big, grandiose event. It can be something quick. You can do it literally without saying a word. So as I'm going to do, and I'm going to make it a point to do it, I, in, I uh, suggest you guys do the same. Add more prayer to your life. It really does make a difference. And he loves the communion. Many foes will attempt to extinguish it. But if the unseen hand whoops, behind the wall poured thereon the sacred oil, it will blaze higher and higher. Let us use texts of scripture as fuel for our heart's fire. They are live coals. Let us attend sermons. But above all, let us be much alone with Jesus. There's a lot of church talk in here about the going to the churches and fellowship and everything. And I'm with you guys. I've seen what the churches are becoming, and it's just not a comfortable place to go anymore. <clears throat> it used to be a place of fellowship, now it's a place of money laundering and um, clicks and judgment and mocking. I mean, I, I can go to a church and literally be mocked by others. I mean, wh why would I do that? Why do I want to have fellowship with people like that? And this is what I put to, you know, other pastors who say, you got to find a church, you got to find a church. Well, some places don't have it. And they're starting to realize that what they have in their area is very unique and very rare because most churches are turning the wrong way. And I'm with you. I get it. It's hard. It's hard to find. And you get disappointed so many times you don't want to go in the in the building. Well, here's another one. Let's try this one. I've been to 36 of them in my county. Let's see what this one has to offer. And you go in there and it's the same thing over again. You just get to the point where you just, you're afraid to even go in the building anymore because you already know what to expect. And I'm with you. I understand. I had high hopes for the church I was going to, and it changed. And I hated to see it because I really liked it there. I really liked the people there. But I've learned that there is no place you're going to find where you're going to be comfortable. You may find one that's good, but it's going to be a very rare, rare occurrence. And there are people that are driving hours and hours to get to other churches. Uh, there's uh, uh, Jack Hibbs talks about this. Um, Jan Markell talks about it. Um, John MacArthur talks about it. You know, these guys that have these big churches that are well known and have a lot of room, but are on the right track and doing the right thing and preaching the right message. And there are people that are driving hours to get there just to go to church on Sunday. That's amazing. I'm glad that they have that ability. Um, 
I think, the, well, with gas as expensive as it is now, I couldn't possibly drive up to Dallas. There's, I think, I hear there's a couple of good ones up there, but I don't know. It's just, it's so unfortunate that that's where things have gone. But that doesn't mean we can't have fellowship in the Spirit. That doesn't mean we can't connect here online. A lot of these pastors who here just recently were, you got to find a church, you got to find a church, you got to have fellowship, you got to have fellowship, have started to realize J.D. Farrakh is one of them. He mentioned it, is how important their online ministry is because there are people around the world who don't have this ability. Ask anybody in the UK. I have subscribers from the UK. Ask them and they'll tell you there's no churches here. Everywhere that we find fellowship is underground. They're experiencing that in the UK, places in Africa, Canada. There's a lot of places where there are no churches. There's plenty of mosques, but there's no churches. It's just gotten to the point where we don't know who to trust. Prayer. Pray to the Lord to guide your eyes, to guide your hand, to guide your steps. That if there's one close enough to you that you can get to, Lord, send me there. Show me where that is. And if there isn't one, Lord, then lead me to somebody online that I can have fellowship with, I can communicate with, that I can listen to and talk to. I'm going to give to you guys here as real as I can. Like we're in a room together talking. That we're we're friends. We're connected. We know each other. Because that's what church is. It's personal. That is, that's what ministering is. It's personal. Because I can't find that out there. Oh, sure, I can go and get patted on the back and people tell me I'm doing a good job when I go and donate a whole bunch of my time or a bunch of my money to a church. I can go find that anywhere. But I don't find the personal connection. What I find is people constantly testing me to see if whether I'm their friend or whether I think differently than them. And if I think differently than them, they do everything they can to try to change the way I think. I can't find that. And so I'm going to give that here. If this is the ministry that I'm doing and the Lord has led me into this, I'm going to give that here. Personal connection, personal interpretation, personal speaking back and forth, conferring with each other. I struggle with this. I would love to go to a church. I loved it when I was going to my last church, but I saw the changes coming. I saw the money, the, it was a big focus. I saw other issues popping up, and it's like, okay, well. And it was just like, when I got there, I was like, the Spirit of God is over this house. And then all of a sudden, it disappeared. I was like, it's not here no more. Something changed. So I turned that over to the people who want that kind of stuff. It's, it's like that's what Satan is trying to do. And we know that's what he's trying to do, destroy the church. And he's doing it from the inside out. So what do we do? We pray. We pray. We commune with the Lord. See, I don't have to go to a building to have fellowship. I have fellowship in the Spirit. With you guys, with him. So even if I'm alone... I still have fellowship. I'm still connected. I don't have to go to a building. Would it be nice? Yeah. I would love. I would love for there to be an ability that a bunch of us can connect at a central location here in Texas. Too expensive now because the gas is horrible. And have a Bible study for an hour or two. Meeting in a parking lot somewhere and just having a Bible study for an hour or two and then break. I would love to meet with brothers and sisters so we could just read the scriptures together. I don't want to be preached at by someone who makes a message that 
sometimes has an effect, sometimes it doesn't. I don't really preach that about what I should and shouldn't be doing by somebody who doesn't even do those things. I want to go through the scriptures and discover more with other people who are looking for the same thing. I want to worship Jesus Christ with other people who just want to worship Jesus Christ. Where are those churches? I never read anywhere where the apostles stood up in a pulpit. They worship the Lord together. We don't have that anymore. If we do, nobody knows where it is or nobody's, nobody's presenting it anywhere. It's hidden. I know it exists. So what do we do? We pray. That's our communion. That's our connection. That's our interaction. We pray. See, the fire shall never shall ever be burning on the altar. That if that our heart is that altar, that fire, that desire should always be burning. The desire for truth, the desire for our each other, the desire for Jesus Christ should always be burning. Whether we pray or not, it should always be burning. It's a spiritual act. It's a spiritual connection. That's a fulfillment of what the law. What the law was. A spiritual fulfillment, which is what the law was a physical picture of the spiritual. Everything about the law, everything about what was done was a spiritual or was a physical representation of the spiritual. The Bible confirms this. So let us pray. Let us take a moment to give thanks. Lord, thank you for bringing that person into my life because what they, the interaction I had with them was wonderful. Thank you for giving me opportunities to do something small for somebody. Give them a cup of cold water. Or a gallon of gas. <laughs> a kind word. To pay for their soda and their barbacoa taco at the register at the convenience store because they didn't have enough money. Let's thank him for having a peaceful life, a quiet life, open eyes to see the truth, to understand his word with an open mind and an open heart to receive it. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name, for you are the great king of the universe. Thank you for this word, and we thank you for this devotion. Father, there are many of us who don't have the ability. To, we just can't find anybody that is doing good biblical teaching. There are so many hang-ups. There are so many uh, um, um, clicks and judgments and all these issues that we have to fight all the time. It's hard to find a group of believers that, that just want to worship you. Nothing else. Just want to worship you. And I will admit that I have become discouraged. I will admit that I have I don't pray as much as I should. I don't interact as much as I should spiritually. I do I, I I'm constantly thinking. I'm constantly have my mind on it. I constantly have my heart on it. I have my desires for those things are there. But I, I admit, Father, that I don't pray as much as I even I think I should. I don't communicate that way as much as I think I should. I don't intercess for people as much as I think I should. But I also know that I am imperfect and sometimes cannot do that. Cannot even fulfill my own requirements or my own uh, ideas about these things. So if I can't do that for myself, I know I can't do that for you. But Lord, I ask that you make us to communicate more in the spirit. Make us to communicate more on a case-by-case, day-by-day basis. Make us to communicate more over the little things. Make us convicted to take the time to pray. 
we, we can't find fellowship. And there are many of us out here that we cannot find a place to go because so many places are corrupted. Satan has got his fingers in everything. And it's scary to go to some places now because immediately when you go, it's automatic apprehension. It's automatic. You, you see it already. And it's like, I, I have to leave. I can't stay here. I'm, I'm literally walking in the devil's den. And it's been very well disguised. Father, make us to draw together spiritually in fellowship. This is one of the persecutions we're going to face. This is one of the sufferings as Christians we're going to face. And I know my brothers and sisters listening are agreeing for the most part in this. They, they're in the same boat, many of them. Some of them have been lucky enough to run into other brothers and sisters, and they connect. They listen to these videos together, or they do their own Bible study together. Wonderful. It is a great encouragement, but I know also for those of us who can't and are by ourselves, I have no one that I can physically go and talk to here. I even try to talk to my wife and, and she changes the subject. All she could think about last night was that she was standing on the banks of the Rio Grande River in Colorado and I'm trying to share some stuff with her. Be that as it may. Oh, and as a side note uh, to everybody who, when I was talking about the whole moving to Colorado thing, yeah, the Lord has been stonewalling her at every turn so far. So it's pretty obvious he doesn't want us to go anywhere at the moment. That's something else. Um, those of us who are by ourselves, Lord, you strengthen us and energize us. You keep that fire burning. You feed that fire on the altar to keep it going. Because when we're together with each other, we all work together. We all stir up each other and stir up that fire. But those of us that are by ourselves, you keep that fire going. You keep that love going, that desire going. The loneliness is real. I, 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 I stumble across sermons all the time about the loneliness of believers. It's real. It's a real thing. You can be lonely in the middle of a room. I find, I find myself a lot of times like that. I feel like I'm by myself when I'm in a room full of people. Ignored for the most part. I got somebody else in my house telling me they love listening to my sermons. But yet every time I'm trying to do a video, and it's not even a sermon I'm doing, but I'm trying to do a video, and all, all of this is belching and farting and making all kinds of noise. Well, I can't do that kind of stuff in the other room. And so why do they really want to listen? just to make them feel good about themselves? Or do they really want your truth? Well, I know why. So I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. I'm going to keep my pearls of wisdom to myself. I'm going to share them here with people who really want it. And Father, that sounds selfish. But you told us don't cast your pearls before swine. You, you told us keep your wisdom to yourself. If they won't receive it, there's no reason to share it. And so some of us, quite a few of us, end up alone. To being the only ones that can come together and communicate. Being the only ones that can talk to ourselves about these things, to share these things. The discouragement is real. You encourage me. You keep my fire burning. You push me. You drive me. You motivate me to keep going and keep doing this. I have to keep doing this. He who is faithful in a little, I will make him faithful over much. I have to keep doing this. This is all I have. So, Father, I ask that you strengthen us and keep our fire burning bright. Keep us always ready and diligent. Keep us at a moment's notice able to move and react. Make us to fulfill your will in our lives. Make us to honor you in all, as much as possible that we, can do, that we do. Make us to acknowledge you and make us to stop and pray and commune. That strengthens our spirit too. Mm. 
My hope and prayer, Lord, is that this video will strengthen those listening, inspire those listening, keep that fire stoked up in those listening. And our consolation in all this is that on that day of redemption, we get to see each other in heaven. And we will have an eternity to fellowship. So if we don't have it here, we are definitely going to get it there. What we don't have here, what we're not able to have here, we will have beyond measure in heaven. So if I don't have it here, you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. Because I know I'll have it in heaven with you. That gives me encouragement. Even, Lord, and you know my heart. Even if I don't pray as much as I should. Even if I don't fellowship as much as I should. Even if I don't connect as much as I should. Or even as much as I could. I still have love for you. I still, my desire is still for you. Even if I become completely discouraged and just I'm going through the motions, I still have love for you. I still have love for the brethren. And my desire is that we all come together. So since I know the chances are very low it'll happen here, I am hopeful and looking forward to our reunion in heaven with you forever and that is a wonderful mercy and a grace to know that so father i thank you for your mercy and your grace on this and everything else i thank you for your great love your free salvation that you've offered to all that i thank you for the payment that jesus made on the cross for us so that we may have heaven so that we may dwell together In Jesus Christ's name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining me for Morning Devotion. Everything I said, I meant. What is coming and what we're experiencing now will not stop what will happen after. Because when he comes and he takes his church, we then will stand with him in heaven, with each other in heaven. So if we don't have fellowship now, we'll have plenty of time then. If I don't pray as much as I should now, I have plenty of time to worship him then. If I'm discouraged now, I will be encouraged then. So though I have these normal things, these normal trials and tribulations that I wrestle with every day in my own life and in my own spirit, all of that goes away when we get there. And that's my hope. That's my driving force. That's my encouragement. That's my stoking up of the fire on the altar of my heart. He does that. Every morning, every evening, he does that. So if you were in the boat that's very similar to mine, which most of us are in that boat right now, there are far more people out there in that boat than, than, than most of us realize. Be encouraged. Because he will not let his children fall by the wayside. He will not let those that are his be lost. And that, to me, is a wonderful, wonderful encouragement.
and it's something that I look forward to every day. Something that I long for. And as a, another side note to what I mentioned earlier, I mentioned it because I didn't want to forget it. Um, I was talking here the other day about my wife wants to move to Colorado and she's been looking for houses and we can't afford that. And There's so much going on right now. I mean, j just to, I, I would have to make five trips just with my flat trailer to move equipment and vehicles. That's $2,000 in fuel right there just to, to achieve that. Five round trips minimum, not counting all the other stuff we have to move. If it's a U-Haul, that's fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. That's about twelve to fifteen hundred just for the truck to go that far. That's not counting fuel. So yeah, the Lord and I asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do on this? This is one of my prayers, Lord. I don't know what to do to get her to calm down. Let's just deal with what we got. We have a place paid off. Let's just fix this up. She, she's got wonderlust. She, she always has to have change. She's not happy with what she has. She has to have something different. So I asked the Lord, what, what do I do? I don't know what to do and I don't know what to say because everything I try is, is nothing. So I said, Lord, if you want us to move, if that's okay with you, show me. Make it possible for us to do that. But if not, then show me. Make it not possible for us to do that. Well, he has made it impossible. Because she had all these places she's been showing me, sending me emails and all that. And I, for one, I like Colorado. I don't want to live there. Weather is horrible. With my connective tissue disease, that cold is going to kill me. And that's a liberal, very, very liberal state. They've got a lot of weird ideas. Uh, everywhere you drive, you're driving about nothing but high people because... They've legalized several different narcotics there. And uh, it's just not a it's not a good place to go to. I'd rather live in North Texas. And so she decided today, or last night, yesterday, to go and they were going to go look at a bunch of those places that she had been sending me. Were nice places, you know, 250000 350000 No, I'm not making a $1,000 mortgage payment. And every single one of them was garbage. <laughs> she, she went to a whole bunch of them. They spent the whole day driving and looking. And she was very disappointed because she found so many of them that were not so, not so great. And I was like, well, so the Lord's made it obvious. He don't want us to go anywhere right now. And that's fine with me. We have a home. We can fix this up. We can make changes to this. If I can get her on board with that, I can make changes and make this place nice. I just can't ever get her on board with that because she's she wants to go. Go, go, go. She picked the worst possible time to do it when the housing market is super high. It's coming down, but it's super high. I mean, there were houses that we were looking at that started out at one price, were taken down the next day, and two days later put back up at a higher price. No. Nope. There were places that I was looking at that were $150,000 just six months ago and are now $350,000 now. No, I'm not doing that. So just like the last time the Lord showed her, he showed her again. So I'm hoping I can get her to calm down for a little while and focus on here. We've got stuff we have to do here. There's things that need to be done here. So maybe I can get her focus changed, get her direction changed, get her more motivated to be happy with what she has. I'm, I'm happy with what I have. This is a great gift from the Lord. We'll see. But that's just my first world problems that I have to deal with every day. We all have issues. We all have struggles. We all have problems. These are the things that we pray about. These are the things the Lord is helping us with and addressing in us and with us and for us. Keep praying. Keep striving for what's right. Keep fighting for the truth. Because pretty soon it's all going to come to a stop. Pretty soon it's all going to end for us. And we will be with him and we won't have these problems anymore. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I will see you in the next video.